Well, good morning, everyone. If you saw yesterday's vlog, you know that at the wee hours of the late part of the night last night, I decided to tie-dye some more shirts for you guys. And so they've been sitting for about 12 hours. I'm going to rinse them out. And the next time you see this, I will have pulled them out of the washer and we'll see what the final product looks like. Well, I think I'm going to wear this today. When I was in Paso Robles last week, I popped in one of those little artsy stores and I found this eco-friendly Bob Marley necklace for like 10 bucks. So I couldn't pass it up. So I'm going to break it out today. Well, all the shirts are done. They're a little damp, but I'm going to lay them out and show you what they ended up looking like. I'm pretty happy with them. Pretty good. Now this one, you can tell, this is the one that I did the swirl in the bottom. I started it there and twisted it there, so that's why it kind of expands upward. I think that came out pretty cool. What do you think? You think that came out pretty good? What do you think, John? Did it come out good? I saw your tail fluttering. Now that one was our large. I decided to go with light blue, dark blue, and orange on that. And I wanted to uh, go a little light because I like that white bursting in there. So it came out pretty cool. Pretty happy with it. That one will be yours, Ginger. Now that one came out pretty good too. And that one was actually somewhat similar to the first one, except the first one, you know, I did the, uh, I did the twist down here in the corner. And this one, instead of using lime green, which is what I used on that one, I used the regular dark green on this one so you can see that little splash going around there. So they're a little different, different colors of green. Now this is the one that I was the most concerned with. I was actually worried this one wasn't gonna come out very good because I was using a lot of colors and a lot of sections. I ended up doubling the blue, so that's why you'll see like a little bit more of the uh, light blue up in here, that turquoise and stuff right up here. But uh, man, I think this came out actually maybe the best one. I don't know, it's pretty weird, pretty wacky, I love it. Here we are. Well, hello, my friends. It's your old pal Jordan the Lion. Well, we made it out to the park because, like I said, I did tie dyeing all night. This guy has been a total gentleman, letting me get it done and not harassing me or whining or whimpering or anything. So, we had to bring him out to the park, and it's a busy day out here. We have a pretty cool vlog today. Now, if you've been following my channel for a while, you've probably noticed that I have a lot of music you may not recognize as the theme music for my vlogs. That music was done by a band that was around pretty much when I was in high school called 84 Nash. A few of the members have changed over time, but they still exist. They're called Connections now, and the singer of that band is out here visiting California for the week. He just stopped and burped. Now one of the things that I've always admired about Kevin was that he has this amazing knowledge of music, but he also loves baseball just as much, which is kind of a rarity because there's kind of this weird belief that a lot of people that are into music aren't into sports. He's a huge sports fan, so tonight he, I, and his girlfriend are going to the Dodger game. We're actually going to do the vlog there, and our vlog actually has nothing to do with baseball. That's right. Our vlog today is actually about a tragedy that happened at Dodger Stadium one time and because of that tragedy, to my knowledge, they've never done this again. Now, one of the cool hot spots that people like to meet up at before a Dodger game here in Los Angeles is uh, it was, and I think still owned, by the lead singer of the Afghan, Wiggs, Greg Dooley. It's a bar called The Shortstop. So we're gonna actually meet up with Kevin and his girlfriend over at The Shortstop today. And it's weird, for as many dogs as there are out here and everything, he's still sidetracked. He's doing his 20 minutes of ignoring everyone. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> He's joined the picnic. You big ham, look at you. They were trying to enjoy a picnic and you, you came and did this. And that's all for the Hollywood sign today. Let's head out of here. This guy's so worn out he can't even chew his bone. Can't even work on the spare rib. Well, I almost hate to put this on the vlog, but I do want to be honest. I love these shoes, and you guys might remember when I got them. Somebody from Puma sent them to me because they said I would love them, and I do love them. Um, but, and they're my favorite travel shoes. Actually, I wore these to Italy, and they were perfect, but 
they went defective and they split so I actually bought shoe glue and I have glued them um, three times now and it's not staying so I I messaged the guy and just told him what happened and he actually said hey I'll send you a new pair and asked me if I wanted a different color gave me some color options so I got them in the mail today let me show you well there we go gave me the option and I chose the red ones they kind of look orange here just because of this camera but uh but they're red so I have uh I have a new pair of shoes to break in for the, uh, the walk up the hill into Elysian Park tonight. All right, gang. Well, we're gonna go out and meet my friends over at the shortstop now. Let's go. There's the Armenian Genocide mural. Now, right up here to the right is the Elliott Smith figure eight mural where he took his album cover photo right there. Well, you can tell we're getting close. There's a uh, makeshift Dodger store. Not officially licensed, I guarantee it. And there's the burrito stand that Graham Parsons took his album cover photo in front of. <laughs> well, here it is. I, like I said, I'm a huge fan of the Afghan wigs and this is the local bar owned by, well, a group that's headed up by Greg Dully, who's the lead singer of Afghan Wigs. And if you're ever interested in checking out a really great Afghan Wigs album, I would recommend Black Love. But this actually has a much deeper story than just being like a hip bar now to go to before a Dodger game. This actually used to be a cop bar, a really well-known cop bar, like police officer bar, uh, before Greg Dully owned it throughout the 80s, 90s, and even before that. And what uh, made it famous was the officer, Rafael Perez, who was part of the Rampart scandal. He, uh, he mentioned a lot of the uh, kind of um, corrupt dealings that would go on or would be discussed here. And they actually have a, uh, or they used to have a chair here, um, right at the corner of the bar. It was called the captain's chair and it was Mark Furman's chair. But if you, uh, if you know the name Rafael Perez, not only was it part of the Rampart scandal, but he was also one of the people that was uh, accused of being part of the cover-up or part of the killing of Notorious Big, Biggie Smalls. So, yeah, and then there was even before that when it was a cop bar, supposedly they claimed there was a robbery attempt here that nobody's ever been able to verify, but there was, um, you know, the person who they claim made the attempt was killed here, but there was never an investigation as to whether it was a legit killing, and they said because it was a cop bar that maybe they felt like there was some, uh, some you know, cover-up or special treatment. So who knows? And even way before that, this all this building right here used to be all part of one thing, and there was a murder here even then. So there's like a whole ghost story associated with this place. Check out the police box. So one of the waitresses just pointed this out. She said these are gun lockers that they used to have to uh, put your guns in when you came in here. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, now it's like a modern bar with uh, pictures of the Dodgers history all over the place. And she just pointed out to me that the uh, the rails right here are actually police batons. The pool table. Oh yeah, you can see right here you've got uh, Tommy Lasorda, Pee Wee Reese, Walter Alston, Duke Snyder, uh, Carl Ferrillo. And then when you go down the hallway, you've got all these... Uh, This is the hallway to the bathroom. And then the dance floor. Pretty cool place. Just waiting for my friends to show up here. Look at this old picture. All right, now we're working our way up the hill. You can tell, Vin Scully Ave. And here are my friends from Ohio. We'll be vlogging together in uh, in two days. <laughs> now we just have to walk up this hill, enter the fun. All right, we have made it. Well, there's the uh, the Dodger bullpen. They're warming up, and once we get to our seats, I'll tell you what the vlog is today. Even though I could have done probably an entire vlog on just the shortstop. Well, here we are. In 1963, very uncustomary to Dodger Stadium, they had 
the one and only boxing event here. The stadium was only a couple of years old and they had a bout that was too big to be housed anywhere else in Los Angeles for the normal venue. So they had three major competitions that night, three, three title bouts. One of them being the featherweight championship fight between Sugar and Davey Moore. Now Davey Moore was the four year reigning champ at that point. They fought for 10 rounds. In the eighth round, Davey Moore hit the ropes and went down and looked like maybe he was done for the night, but he kept on fighting and eventually was knocked out and lost in the 10th round. After the fight, he went into the dressing room, he did his interviews, complained of his head hurting, and then passed out, fell into a coma for the next two days and died. Now, that was the last time that they ever had boxing here in Dodger Stadium. Now, it was memorialized by Bob Dylan. If you've ever heard any of the Bob Dylan bootleg albums, those, those bootlegged record CDs, he sings a song called Who Killed Davey Moore and he takes a pretty unique perspective on it because the song never actually came out it was only on the bootlegs but he wrote a song basically from the perspective of everyone involved and how they were at fault and he basically blames everybody involved except for himself and the family of Davey Moore. He writes it from the perspective of the referee, the managers, the fans, the gamblers, the, the journalists, and basically, in a way, in every instance, faults them all and then has them wrap up each verse by telling how it wasn't their fault and why it wasn't um, them that caused it, it was actually him. And what's weird is you would think because of the subject matter that that Bob Dylan was trying to make something like a protest song against boxing, but when he was interviewed about it, he said that wasn't the case at all. In fact, he said it wasn't about boxing, it wasn't about the violence. He said all I was doing was writing um, a song and taking the lyrics directly from the newspaper. And so he said he didn't intend for it to be a, an attack on boxing, but as you can imagine, that's what it became, and people started questioning whether boxing was considered too barbaric. So, pretty much throughout the 1964 year, whenever Bob Dylan performed, he was performing that song, Who Killed Davey Moore? Who and Why Did He Die For? All right, well, it's almost game time. We decided to come out here and get something to eat, and I always love checking out the uh, gigantic hot dog man out here. And then we're going to head into the park and find something unique. Every year, Dodger Stadium kind of changes the food based on their vendors, and now apparently every time they have an opposing team, they have an opposing team's hot dog. So we're going to see if we can find one and try it. So we just found out if it's your first time to Dodger Stadium, they give you a, a first time pin. Your first time Dodger game pin, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and there's the massive Tommy Lasorda bobblehead. I love it. Kevin's gotta get his picture with uh, with old Tommy. It's like a dream, dream of his to come to Dodger Stadium, so it's pretty cool. Man, that score is not looking good for us tonight. I'll tell you that much. empty seating out here tonight but it's been a it's been a fun experience I always love coming to the ballpark all right we are gonna leave the stadium now and we're gonna go to a place that my mom loves yeah Kevin has uh, brought up going to the Dresden and when my mom was out here visiting she loved the Dresden so we're gonna go see Marty and Elaine tonight all right we have made it to the famous Dresden. You might have seen this in the movie Swingers, but you're about to see Marty and Elaine right now. First, let me show you the dining room, even though we're not going to spend any time in here tonight. Had a date in here one time. Very posh, very old school, as you can tell. You feel like you've kind of, uh, when you're here, you kind of feel like you've walked back into time, like you're in Casablanca or something. Look at the uh, look at the glass, all the images on the glass. I love that. Now let me show you their. Uh, look at that! Isn't that great? Let me show you their wall of fame, all their uh, signed photos back here. 
James Coburn. That's that's actually Marty and Elaine right there. We're gonna see them perform. There's Forrest Ackerman, the man who uh, was responsible for responsible for Famous Monsters of Filmland. He actually lived pretty close to here. Look, there's Milton Berle, and uh, oh, Robert Stack, Dolly Parton. Uh, who else we got up here? Oh, Michael Feinstein. Is that Gene Autry? Uh, Bob Hope, Danny Aiello, Jay Leno, Adam West. There's a scene from Swingers that they signed it. Mel Gibson. Uh, let's see who else do we recognize here? Kiefer Sutherland, Keanu Reeves. I guess we all recognize that guy, don't we? Oh, Tom Petty. Speaking of Tom Petty, look at that. For Marty and Elaine, nice working with you, Tom Petty. That is awesome. Now it looks like they're actually on a uh, on a break right now, so as soon as they come back, we'll start showing you some of it. Now I never really knew much of the history behind Marty and Elaine other than the fact that they perform here, but as I was reading the back of their album, it says that Elaine was actually picked out of 200 music students by the great Stan Kenton to participate in an international jazz festival, so that's how she got her start. Now here's a picture of Elaine the night that she was picked by Stan Kenton for that international festival. And then here's a picture of Elaine with the great Count Basie. Who, if you watched my vlog a couple days ago, was in Blazing Saddles. Tonight is like open mic night where they let people come up and sing with them. So that's kind of what we're what we're witnessing tonight. Thank you. 
Well, what a great day, guys. A long day, but a great day. I hope you guys enjoyed all of our little adventures today. I wanted to call it a night. I wanted to thank FMV, Todd Kastad, Carol Owen, and Kathy Farrell for becoming Patreons. Thank you so much for supporting my channel. Thank you for watching, and we have another big day tomorrow, so don't miss it. I'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great night, and goodbye.